So I love war movies. Any war movie people in the house? You like war movies? What, I know we've talked about this before. I love war movies. I go down a list of them, and, and I'll, I'll share with my favorite all-time war movie is Saving Private Ryan, okay? I love Saving Private Ryan, and here's why I believe we love war movies so much, or maybe even we talked about this earlier, uh, shows like Pacific or Band of Brothers, and there's a variety of them, right? And the reason I believe we love them so much is because there's always... There's good and evil, right? There's always good and evil, and we love it when good is victorious over evil. And there's something inspiring about that. There's something, especially hindsight, that's hopeful, and you look back and you're like, I'm just so thankful that, you know, when I watch Saving Private Ryan, I'm so thankful. I, I'm very familiar with World War II, and gosh, what a, what a momentous time in the history of the world, right? As you look at those movies, you're inspired, you're, you're encouraged, and they're heroes, and they're stories of courage. And the truth is, there's actually a real war going on that you and me don't even see. And a lot of times, especially if you're newer to the faith, you've never really identified what it is. And so, for the next few weeks, we're going to unpack what that war is that maybe you're not too familiar with. Maybe you're familiar with it, but it's a spiritual war. You see, we see the effects of it, but what typically happens, we see the effects, but the gory part of it, the, the worst part of it, is something we don't even see. As a matter of fact, I was told this recently from some, someone on our staff. They said, you realize in, in another um, sect of our, our faith, in the Orthodox sect of Christian faith, they actually use the term, instead of spiritual warfare, they call it the unseen war. And I was like, that's really good. Because we don't see it. We don't see it, but we see the effects of it and feel it, don't we? Maybe even today you felt the effects of an unseen war. It's a real spiritual battle. And the Bible talks about the nature of the battle and how that we are to fight it. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. If you need one, raise your hands and we'll get one for you. If you're like, hey, I need a Bible, hook me up. We can get one for you. You can keep it if you don't have one. Raise your hands. We're going to be in Ephesians, which is in the, uh, if you're looking at your Bible to the right, towards the back, okay? Ephesians chapter 6 is where we'll be today. But what happens when we talk about spiritual war, and maybe when you came in tonight, you're like, man, he's going there, and maybe you get a little uncomfortable with it, or maybe you just get like, yeah, he's going here. Like, we're going to go, we're gonna go uh, against the enemy, and we're going to go to war against him. We're, maybe you get fired up, or you get nervous. Well, I want to read a quote from one of the great Christian theologians in maybe even thinkers of the last generation, C.S. Lewis says this, there are two equal and opposite errors in which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, to just not believe in any of the unseen. Maybe just say, ah, I don't know if that's real. Or the other is to believe it and watch us into feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. I want to stand in the middle, and I want to stand in a place of recognition, knowing this is real, and I want to go to the Bible and find out what the Bible has to say. As you could go to YouTube, and somebody would have all kind of weird things to say about what we're going to talk about. By the way, be careful. Uh, as accessible as information is, a lot of it is not real good information. And so that's why we come here. This is the great information that we need, the great resource. And in Ephesians chapter 6, we find that this war is something we need to fight and engage in, and we don't want to flight. We want to fight. But how do we fight? And, and what is it we fight? And so for the next few weeks, we're going to unpack a lot of this. And I hope to empower you, encourage you, help you see some things clear, maybe even take a little bit of the edge off for you, but also maybe some of you need to have the edge back on you. Are you guys tracking with me? Because this is real stuff. It's a real war. It's really happening as we speak, and we need to be aware of it. We need to understand it. So with this spiritual war in mind, let's go ahead, and I just want to give you uh, some nuts and bolts today. This is what I call Spiritual Warfare 101, okay? If you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to write this first thing down. There's a general command, okay? And the general command from Scripture that we're going to see is to, to be strong. 
Everybody say, be strong. It's to be strong. Now, I want to I unpack what this means, because when you hear this, it's almost, as a, especially as a typical American, we think, well, yeah, I could put it on and I could be strong and I can do it myself, right? Rugged individual. I'm from New Hampshire, right? I run a farm. I'm in Vermont, right? But that's not the point here. You see, it says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul, writing to the Ephesian Christians 2,000 years ago, says this, be a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And he's beginning to have a conversation with the Ephesians about spiritual war. And the first thing he says, it's a general command. You've got to be strong, but not in and of yourself. In who? Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Be strong in his strength. Be strong means this, to depend on his strength. I want to remind you that the God of the universe is omnipotent. That's a theological term that means he is all-powerful. He's lacking none. Uh, he, he's commanded, and if you've been with us through Genesis at all, and we'll be picking back up in November, by the way, for those of you who are type A, like, well, we got to get back to Genesis. We remember when God created, he spoke and it happened. That's the power of God. The same power of God that created as he spoke is the same God who resurrected Jesus from the dead. It's the power of God. And the scripture says right here, Paul says to the Ephesians, it's not our ability, it's not our power, it's not even our weakness, but it's his strength. It is the power that raised Jesus from the dead and he dwells in you and that is the power that we need to be strong in. Not in and of ourselves. And the only way that we can win this war, this unseen war, is to be strong in the Lord. I promise you, you cannot win it on your own. You have to be dependent on his strength. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So this is written, it's interesting, Paul writes this to Ephesians in command form. So he kind of, if, if you've ever studied Ephesians, he kind of, in this particular uh, place in the, in the letter, he kind of steps into like, okay, I am, I am your boss now. I'm your spiritual authority, and I'm speaking this to you. You need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And he's expecting the, the people who are reading this to listen, tune in, and to do something with it. And so the full meaning of this command is, is uh, I found this expanded translation very interesting as it says, allow yourself to be continually strengthened by the power already made available to you in your new position and relationship with Christ. Allow yourself to be continually strengthened, be strong in his mighty power. So the idea here is allow your relationship with God to give you the strength to win the spiritual war. So, so uh, an interesting thing, a, a step, we talk about taking next steps here all the time. And I hope you came here today thinking, considering, hoping to take a next step in your faith. And the next step that I think many of you need to consider is take a next step of being strong. Not in your own strength, but in the strength of the Lord. If you're here today, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He dwells in you. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. You need to depend on him in this spiritual war that is real, this unseen war, this unseen battle that's going on. You need to be strong in the Lord. And maybe that's your next step, to invite the Holy Spirit who lives in you to fill you and give you his power. Here's the next step. Are you ready? Invite him on a daily basis. Holy Spirit, you live in me. I'm surrendered to you. Fill me because I know there's a real battle going on and my strength is enough. I need to have your strength, your mighty strength. In Jesus' name, amen. You need to invite the Spirit to fill you so that you can engage in this war. This is the general command, but what happens here in, in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 10, he kind of gives this general, like, be strong in the Lord and his mighty strength. But he goes in and Paul gives some specific commands now, some specific commands so that you and me can engage in this spiritual unseen war. So he goes on, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. He says, put on. So he says, 
be strong, right, in the Holy Spirit, in his strength, and put on. And, the, and you got to imagine these work all together, right? These all work together I'm about to unpack for you. So let's pick up in verse 11. Verse 11 says this, put on. Everybody say put on. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm. Everybody say stand firm. To stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. So what we see here is this specific command that Paul gives the Ephesians you need to put on. You need to put on armor. You need to put on God's armor so that you can engage in this. You want to be strong. General command. Specifically now, you've got to put on. You've got to put on his armor. Which, by the way, in two weeks, we're going to walk through every piece of the armor that Paul unveils here in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. But today, I, I just want to generally unpack for you and help you understand that there's a real war and that God, through the Spirit, has had Paul pen this to Christians so that we can understand that there's a real war and we need to be strong and we need to put on. This put on is interesting. It's a, it's a sense of urgency. Paul's writing in a way that he's not saying like, hey, take your time here. You know, like, you know, think about this one, buddy. He's like, no, no, no. You need to be strong, but you got to put on. You've got to put on. You've got to take action. It's a decisive act that a believer is urged to make by Paul. So how do you allow yourself to be strong in the Lord while you put on? You put on the armor. You put on the armor. You put on the protection that God has provided. But continually, this is so crucial. Again, we'll unpack this deeper in two weeks. But you're continually and repeatedly putting on spiritual protection that God provides for specific points in time. And this is one of the great urgent commands that Paul, inspired by the Spirit, gives the Ephesians. He's like, there's a real war, and you got to be strong in the Lord, but you've got to put on. You've got to take action. And the express purpose of holding on to your position in Jesus as you are bombarded by Satan's strategic strategies, you have to arm yourself. You put on. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's you consistently in, in multiple times saying, okay, I'm putting on. It, it's almost like on a daily basis. So Paul is saying this, you've got to be strong, but you've got to put on. Because if we don't, we will be vulnerable to the daily assaults of Satan and his minions. And if you're not familiar with Satan and his minions, they're demons. And we're going to talk, we're going to deep dive on Satan and demons next week. There you have it, right? By the way, I want you to understand this, that this is not like an add-on feature. All right, put on, Ed, because you're more seasoned in the faith now, this is what you do. No, this is for all believers. And maybe you're newer to the faith. This is for you. Maybe you've been a follower of Jesus like me for a really long time. This is for me. We've got to put on. This takes discipline. It takes you and me surrendering and saying, okay, I can't do this. I can't fight this. I need to be strong in the Lord. Holy Spirit, you're in me. Give me power. And now I need to put on these certain pieces of armor. And here's why. There's a guy named Satan and he's got strategies. I want you to imagine, we talked about at the beginning here, uh, war movies. The enemy of, of all the war movies is the one that you're rooting against. And you're hoping that the hero in the movies, right, are putting together a plan to combat the bad guys, right? And that's exactly what this is. Satan has a strategy. He knows you. Again, we'll talk about this deeper next week, and if you don't want to miss it, but Satan is coming against you. The Bible says, Paul says right here, he's got strategies. He's thinking strategically about how he can take you and me out. He's thinking strategically on how you and me can be ineffective in the game of life on the rescue mission that God has commissioned us to be a part of. And so Paul says he has strategies, and because he has strategies, you and me have to put on. Satan brings temptations, and he lures us into certain places, and I promise you they're not random. It's because he's strategic. 
They're organized. They're below the belt. Assaults designed to neutralize the very people that God has placed His Holy Spirit to dwell in and to do His work. Satan sees that and knows that and is trying to take you out and make you virtually ineffective. That's his strategy. And Paul says, to counter that, we put on. We put on. We put on the armor of God. Now, here's the next step. Consider the armor of Ephesians 6. I have a next step for you. I want you, in anticipation of next week's message, to read Ephesians chapter 6, and I want you to read all the way through verse 18. Just read uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 18. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to read it every day this week, okay? As you read this, you're going to be prepared for next week's message as we unpack what this armor is, this protection. We, we want to be strong in the power of God, but we've got to put on the armor. We want to be protected. We don't want to go into this battle like, here I am, Satan, hit away, swing away. No, we want to be protected, and the scripture has given us specific armor and protection that we should be equipped with. Why? Because Satan has strategies and we need to be protected. Put on, read Ephesians chapter six each and every day this week. Okay. A next step, real practical for you, isn't it? Let's continue on. So we saw the general command, be strong. We see a specific command, put on, put on the armor. But this one right here, are you guys ready? This is the secret sauce. Look at the person next to you say, here it comes. It's a secret sauce. It's probably not going to wow you that much because ultimately most Christians have become so laissez about what this second command is. Verse 18, check this out. Paul says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Did you catch that? Secret sauce. This this is in verse 18. The secret sauce is to pray. That's the, and that's the second command, put on. But okay, are you guys ready? You've got to pray. You've got to pray. You've got to pray. And I love what he says, pray in the Spirit at all times. And so when you hear pray in the Spirit, maybe you're new to faith and you're like, what the world does that mean, pray in the Spirit? If you were to unpack this in the meaning of it, it means you let the Holy Spirit help you when you pray. The Bible says in other places that the Holy Spirit comes alongside. You're a Christian, Holy Spirit lives in you. And when you pray, you're allowing him to pray through you. You're, he's helping you because Jesus said he's the helper. He calls the Holy Spirit the helper. And so when we're praying in the Spirit, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to pray with us and help us. And so one of the great, one of the great pieces of battle equipment we have is prayer. We're not alone. We have the Spirit in us, and let Him come alongside us. This is the secret sauce. This is where it all really takes place, and it's all behind the scenes. Do you see how this works? Because prayer, look, I think we have this idea that prayer is almost for the the guy up here, you know? Uh, It's maybe for the really spiritual people. But the sad thing is, is it's for all of us if we're followers of Jesus. And we have a very powerful tool in prayer. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. And when we pray in the Spirit with His help, we are able to combat the enemy and his strategies. It's a secret sauce, man. This is it. This is like the A-bomb for Christian faith. This is our our it, prayer. And, And ultimately, I love what Oswald Sanders says about prayer. He says, all the human energy of heart Mind and will can achieve great results. Watch this. But praying in the Holy Spirit releases supernatural resources. When we pray in the Holy Spirit, meaning we allow the Spirit of God to help us in prayer, and we're in that surrender, it unleashes and unlocks all of the power, all of the tools, all of the things to combat the enemy that you could ever imagine. And it ultimately comes down to us having a faith. Like, God, you're with me. I trust you. And I'm allowing you to pray with me and combat the enemy. It's the great spiritual warfare tool that we have is prayer. And the question I have for you is, how's your, how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Are you allowing the Spirit to pray with you? 
Or are you managing your prayer life? It isn't very complicated. Now watch this. If I was the enemy, okay, and I was the enemy to Jesus and his followers, I would want to disable the most powerful weapon. Wouldn't you want to do that? I mean, that's what all enemies want to do. They want to, they want to disable the most powerful weapon. And so when Christians come to me and say, man, I don't know how to pray. I'm not good at it. I don't know where to start. I believe the enemy has been at work as part of his strategy to speak and whisper to the ear of a believer that, well, you don't really know how to pray. You're not really good at it. You don't know this. And the truth is, as there is no bad prayer, <laughs> there's no, there's no um, formula to it. It's you and me simply, as Paul says, pray in the Spirit at all times. Allow Him to help you. It's a, it's a simple surrender and praying and in welcoming and inviting the power of God to cover you and to use you to combat the enemy in the spiritual war. So in the coming weeks, we're going to unpack that further. So, some good commands. Be strong. Put on. Pray. So here, here's the big, um, I guess you could say the big thing is, why? Why? Why all these commands? And why pray in the Spirit? And why put on? And, and why be strong? Well, it's ultimately this. We've got to be aware. You need to know why. And I want to unpack for you why. Verse 12. For we, did you catch that? For we, Paul is bringing it together. He's not saying you, for we. He's saying I'm a part of this. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. The why. Why you need to put on the armor. Why you need to be strong. Why you and me need to pray. Why? Well, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Awareness time, here's what it is. But you're fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. He's like, you, you need to know why. You need to put on, be strong, and pray. There is an absolute assault going on that you don't even see. Let me give you a little context here. The Ephesian church, the people who were reading this letter originally 2,000 years ago, were going through difficulties, different than our difficulties. We have our own, and I don't want to discount them, but I promise you the difficulties of the Ephesian church 2,000 years ago were much more complex than ours. You see, just because they were followers of Jesus, they were being, they were being harmed, they were being fired from their jobs, they were being harmed physically, emotionally, spiritually. Their own family would disown them. They, they had a lot of obstacles just because they were followers of Jesus. The government was coming against them. The religious rulers were coming against them in a variety of ways. So they had all kinds of things happening. And so Paul writes to them that, hey, this is all real. I understand it. But I want you to understand this too. As much as the government is coming against you, it seems, as much as people are threatening you, I want you to know that's not the real war. That's not the real war. We need to hear this today, don't we? The real war is not the president. The real war is not the government. The real war is not your boss at work. The real war is not the family. The real war is not you fill in the blank. The real war is spiritual. And it is going on as we speak. If you were to, and I, it would be really cool to do this. I think it would cause me to wet myself and you as well, if we put on spiritual goggles and we're able to see the spiritual world. Ooh, I don't want that. I trust that it's real. There's just some things I don't want to see. Are you tracking with me? And the, what I love that Paul says here is he said it wasn't the real, the real reason for me urging you to put on, the real reason for me urging you to, to um, to be strong and to pray. It's not the government and the religious authorities and all the things that are coming against you right here. No, no, no. It's a real war, friends. It's a real spiritual war. And I love that Paul says this. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. Government, 
bosses, you fill in the blank. That's not the real war, friends. If I, look, again, if I'm the enemy, I want you to think it is. Are you with me here? If I'm the enemy, I want you to think, yeah, the president's the problem. If, if I was the enemy, I want you to think that your boss is the problem or your spouse is the problem or you fill in the blank, whatever it might be right in front of you. If I'm the enemy, I want you to think that. Meanwhile, the real war is going on and it's spiritual. And Paul knew this. And he unpacks that right here, that the real war is not flesh and blood enemies, but it's against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, not the seen world. See, the real reason is what's going on behind the scenes. Our real struggle, the fight that Paul mentions here, is a battle, it's a wrestling match to the death. And it's not against physical or material adversaries like people, circumstances, and organization. It's a hierarchy of demonic forces doing battle in the spiritual realm against you and me and everybody they can face. In the original language, what's interesting here for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world and against mighties and mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. The word fighting is actually struggle. It's struggle. And the word struggle, the Ephesians would have understood it in the original language. It's the, the idea of wrestling. Um, Greek, the Greek method of wrestling. I don't know if you've ever seen this or Roman Greco wrestling. It's very hands-on. It's, it's very grippy. Are you with me? Not something I want to be involved with. Right? And, and it's a struggle. It's hand-to-hand combat. And that's what Paul is conveying here. It's this hand-to-hand. You're involved, whether you realize it or not. And so if you're not putting on, and you're not being strong, and you're praying, then guess what? The enemy's the one who's doing his thing. You're not involved with it at all unless you're being strong, putting on and praying. You've got to be aware of this. We've got to be aware of this. The source is not flesh and blood. It's an invisible war. Again, verse 12, he says this, and maybe you picked up on this and were a little intrigued. I want to unpack it for just a second. We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Watch this. Against mighty powers in this dark world against evil spirits in heavenly places. Did you catch that? What's happening here is a list of spiritual powers. It's kind of a list there. He he differentiates different spiritual powers. Did you catch it? And these different powers, well, they have like a hierarchy and it, it, it conveys there's organization from the enemy. I want you to hear this. Satan, the enemy, is very organized. We just read it. He's strategic. He's got strategies. But what we see here is he's very organized. He, he's got, just like a traditional military would have different forms of combatants. In the United States, I know we have many who've served in the military. We love that. My father is a veteran, and I have two nephews that are veterans, and they, my nephew served in the Marines. My father served in the Air Force, as we like to say to him, the Chair Force. He, I love you, Dad. That's the one I'd go to. I like the Air Force. But the enemy is just as organized, if not greater organization than we could ever imagine. Matter of fact, there are generals, there are privates, there are ranks, just like our military structures. And there are demonic powers that are arranged according to role and power. That's what's being conveyed here. And I love that Paul does this because he wants the Ephesians to know and he wants you and me to know that Satan is no one to fool around with. He, he's strategic and he's organized. And if you and me think we can just get by in this life, just kind of, you know, hop, skip, and jump, and not be strong, not put on, and not pray. We have got a serious problem ahead of us. It is a real struggle and fight 
And Satan is not going to give up and quit. We need to be aware of it. And that's what Paul does here. He unpacks what we need to be aware of. See, I want to side note on this. And it comes back to, uh, in the kind of the introduction of this message, I said some people overemphasize spiritual warfare, right? I've been around long enough and I've been in those places, right? And then there's some people, Christians, who just completely ignore it, who don't even believe in the supernatural. And I would even wonder if they believe, just saying, okay? I believe this is important that we take note and we address it, and Paul does here, but I don't think we should over, overemphasize anything in this, and I don't think we should poorly translate any of this. See, some have gotten so detailed about that little verse and even make things up. Again, going back to the YouTube videos, beware. God didn't give us that in Scripture. He gave us right here simply, he's organized. He didn't tell us all about the organization we don't know all the details of it. I promise you God does. And our strength is in him. So don't worry about it. But we need to know that he's strategic. Satan is strategic. And he's organized. And because of that, we better be ready. We better be ready. So here's a step. Are you ready? Be aware. Don't shelf this. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus for a, a long time. And this to you is just almost like the teacher from Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 right? And you're just like, oh, another. No, no. Don't disregard this. Be aware. And here's a step. Read Ephesians 6. Are you picking up on this? Read Ephesians 6, 1 through 18. Read it. Because we need to be aware. I promise you, Satan is aware of you. He knows you. Uh, he's got his minions tracking you. He, he's got people tracking you. His, his demonic forces know you and know your ways. Strategic and organized. So you and me need to be aware of it. And we need to be a people who listen to these commands. Be strong. Put on. And pray. Pray. That's how we combat it. So here's the thing. We have responsibilities in this invisible spiritual war. We just do. We need to be aware of the battle. Um, for the next few weeks, that's exactly what we're going to do. Awareness. It's a real war. It's happening. Don't ignore it. Don't overemphasize it. Don't give him too much credit. But be aware. Oh, and by the way, we need to be strong. Daily surrender to the Spirit of God. Invite Him to fill you. Invite the Holy Spirit to fill you and to empower you because the only strength that you can really have access to in this spiritual war is the strength of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So a daily invitation of the Spirit to fill you, very important. Put on, put on the armor. Read Ephesians 6. We'll talk about it in two weeks and pray. Don't complicate it. Don't, don't be intimidated by it. Everybody in this room can pray. You know what prayer is? One of my mentors told me to say, Chris, prayer is simply us talking to God. And that's it. Why do we complicate it? It's us talking to God. And I promise you, he wants to hear you. And when we pray, we pray in the Spirit, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to help us. So a few next steps for you. Uh, obviously, read Ephesians 6. But I also have a couple more. Come back. Come back next week. And, and here, I'm going to warn you, next week might be a little PG-13. Are you with me? So you don't want to miss next week. It's important. And so that's the next step. I encourage you to take another next step is this. I do believe this is a great opportunity to invite. You're like, well, this is kind of weird and stuff. I said, listen, the world we live in is weird. And all the things, I don't know if you've seen the latest movies that are coming out. 
they are ev- there's some evil movies that are running trailers right now that <laughs> Penny's turning away, I'm turning away, and it's just there's some straight up evil. And, and the truth is, is, I think our world is in tune with this stuff. So why wouldn't we invite our friends, family, coworkers, and neighbors to talk about something they're already tuned into? So I'd encourage you to invite somebody. Next week, we're talking Satan and demons. <laughs> Again, we're not going to give him too much glory or any of that. We're going to give God the glory, but we need to know the enemy a little bit, right? And so we're going to be more aware. So come back next week. And then lastly, and this, I believe this is, this is the thing that we need to lean into the most, is prayer. I'd encourage you, maybe when we were talking about that, that command that Paul gave the Ephesians to pray in the Spirit for you is like, ah, I don't know, no, do it. Where do I start? Just start praying. As a matter of fact, this evening, after, after we have a little, bit of, uh, a little bit more conversation here, I'm going to have some friends come to the front and we're going to pray with you. Maybe this is something that is really kind of heavy in your life, spiritual attacks, warfare. And you're like, man, this is kind of my space where I'm at right now, and I sense that there's something cooking. We want to pray with you. And that's a next step. But I believe we all have a next step, and I'd encourage you to take it. Will you, will you pray with me? Lord, uh, I just thank you so much for the opportunity we have to come here today and, and worship you and celebrate you and 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 become more aware of, of an unseen war that's really happening. God, help us to be honest about where we are in this unseen war. Help us to be honest about where we stand with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this spiritual war that we speak of it really comes back to us being honest about ourselves. You, you can't really engage in this war unless you come back to ground zero. And that ground zero is you being real about you. The Bible says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory. Me, you, we've all sinned. And I know that's kind of an old fashioned word, but sin simply means Missing the mark, it means do wrong things or doing wrong things, like lying, cheating, stealing, sleeping around, addiction. So I could go on. For all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory. God is holy. We painted this picture tonight that God is holy. He's perfect. He's the creator of the universe. And because God is holy and perfect, he can't be in the presence of imperfection, sinners. He can't be in a natural relationship. It's just impossible because of his glory, his holiness. So that causes a natural broken relationship. Maybe you feel that tonight. You just feel far from God, a broken relationship. That's what sin does. But it's bigger than that. Matter of fact, It's way bigger than even this right here, right now. I mean, um, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death. And that simply means this, that the consequence of our sin isn't just a broken relationship between us and God. That's painful. Maybe you're here today and you feel that wedge between you and God. But the ultimate consequence of sin is way bigger than that. For the wages of sin is death. The consequence of sin is death. And and let me unpack that. It doesn't just mean ceasing to exist and rotting in the ground, dying and having a headstone. That's part of it, that you will die. Ten out of ten of us will die. All of us in a hundred years, none of us will be here, right? So we're all going to die. That's the infection of sin. It's it's in all of us. But what that scripture is is speaking of isn't just the natural state that we're going to die, but... It is also the supernatural that you will die, and when you die without your sins removed, you will spend eternity separated from God. It's an eternal death. And you would spend eternity separated from God in a literal place called hell. 
sin is real and the consequence of sin is real. And here's the thing. You and me are all going to spend eternity somewhere. Everyone, every one of us. And again, the question I asked in 100 years, where will you be? Maybe you just heard what I said. And well, Chris, I'm a sinner. I haven't been made right with God. I'm far from him. And apparently when I die... I will spend eternity separated from him in a place called hell. That's a problem. But I'm here to convey to you that there's hope. There's hope. And that's why you're here tonight. And the hope is found in that same verse, Romans chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death, but, (laughs) but the free gift of God is everlasting life in heaven through Jesus Christ. Here's here's what he's saying. The hope is found in God's love for you. For God so loved the world, you and me. He loved us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus. Jesus came and lived a perfect, sin-free life for 33 years. He was arrested by the government and religious officials. He was placed upon a Roman cross as capital punishment, but ultimately as an innocent because he had done nothing wrong. And as he was on that cross, he paid the price for my sins and your sins. And Jesus breathed his last breath as he bled on that cross and he said, it is finished because he did what only he could do is he paid the price for the sins of people. Jesus was placed in a tomb, and three days later, he conquered death and hell. Jesus, Listen, Jesus Christ is the solution to our sin problem. My question for you is this, do you know him? Do you know, do you know Jesus? I want to clarify it. I'm, asking, I'm not asking if you're religious, because I don't care. I'm not asking if you're really smart about God, because apparently we all are. We're sitting in church. We know about God. I'm asking you if you know Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, well, now's your chance. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, and I'm asking for the respect of the room for everybody. No getting up, no whispering, talking, moving. This is just a private moment. If you're here today and you want to you want to meet Jesus. You want to be made right through Jesus Christ. You want your sins forgiven. You want that promised gift of everlasting life in heaven. You want to say yes to Jesus tonight. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to count to 3. And when I get to 3, I'm going to invite you to quietly yet boldly and courageously raise your hand when I get to 3 if you want to say yes to Jesus. Here we go. One, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be rescued. Believe. Two, today's the day. Right here, right now, you can be rescued today. You can have your sins forgiven. You can be made right with God right here, right now by believing. And if that's you three, I want you to just quietly raise your hand right where you are. Chris, I want to say yes to Jesus tonight. I just want to be right with God. Just raise your hand so I can see it. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that this message has encouraged you and challenged you to grow in your walk with God. And if you want to stay up to date on new messages every week, be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified anytime we put up a new video. Here at Riverbank, we're on a rescue mission to reach people with a message of Jesus. And if you would like to partner with us, you can go to riverbankchurch.com give or click the giving link in the description. We love you and we are praying for you. We will see you next week.